Good afternoon, everyone, um, uh, and I'd like to welcome you here this evening to um, the Sheffield DocFest. I'm uh, Damien Cavanagh, the controller of BBC3, um, RTS Channel of the Year 2017, the first TV channel in the world to go online only. Our objective on BBC3 is to back ideas and tell stories that matter to young people, ideas that can help them understand themselves and their place in the world. We want to stimulate emotion and provoke reaction, and I believe Ollie's powerful new doc will do exactly that. The film screens on BBC3 in July as part of the <coughs> BBC's Gay Britannia season, marking the 50th anniversary of the Sexual Offences Act 1967 that partially decriminalised homosexual acts in England and Wales. In the documentary, Ollie explores why the gay community is more vulnerable to mental health issues as he opens up about his own long-term battles with depression. The film has been produced by Antidote Productions, the company behind the critically acclaimed Professor Green documentary, Suicide and Me. I'm delighted to welcome Ollie Alexander, the front, band, front man of the British Electronica Trio, years and years to the festival to discuss making his first documentary, Ollie Alexander, Growing Up Gay. Heralded as the most important pop band of our time, <laughs> years and years has seen a phenomenal rise to fame. The fastest selling album of the year last <clears throat> year, platinum singles and sold out shows at Wembley. Ollie, <laughs> Ollie is its outspoken frontman, a pop culture icon that most fittingly symbolises what it means to be young, gay and British, and a powerful voice on mental health issues and LGBT rights. He has spoken candidly about his own sexuality and long-term battle with depression, which has manifested itself in chronic eating disorders, self-harm and anxiety, ongoing struggles for which he is still on medication and in therapy. Also joining us here this evening is Lilia Monks, executive producer and co-founder of Antidote. She was behind the Professor Green film Suicide and Me, the homeless doc that Professor Green made for us, Dangerous Dogs documentary. She's done a series of shorts for us on BBC Three with new talent Livy Haydock, Live on the Edge. And we've also got Vicky, who is a producer and director of um, Ollie's new doc. Um, she's also directed Cruel Cut, which was a BAFTA-nominated film about FGM, and Jamie's Sugar Rush, which resulted in the introduction of the sugar tax, so you can thank her for that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> we, we, just, we, we just crack on. So, just Ollie, um, f first off, just to um, ask you, yes. uh, why did you want to do this film? Um, well, Antidote approached me about, um, gosh, when was it? About a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah, quite a while ago, a year and a half ago. And um, yeah, it, well, actually, making a documentary wasn't something I ever thought I would do. Um, for various different reasons, and but 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 when Antidote approached me and they said they asked, you know, basically we'll we'll make a show, we'll do whatever you want to do, um, we'll support you in whatever kind of message or anything that you want to explore, and then that sounded interesting to me, and then once I met Vicky, I thought, oh, well, this will be in a really good pair of hands, and I really trusted her that she would be able to tell these people's stories well and be sensitive to the material and you know, be able to make a really good documentary. So I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but I was pretty afraid. I mean, I'm still terrified <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, you know, and also it was a really brilliant opportunity. You know, I never thought I'd get asked to make a documentary. Um, and I thought, well, why not? You yeah. know. Do you, what, what, what were your concerns when you were embarking on it? Um, so, well, I guess... First of all, I never really saw myself in, in, in a role of, of like presenting a documentary, um, so I thought I'd be bad at it. Um, and secondly, um, you know, this area, which I care so much about, LGBT issues and mental health, mm. in very limited, in like a 50-minute format, and would it potentially do more harm than good? And like, mm. you know, there's a real, we really do struggle with representation as LGBT people, and, and I've taken up space now as a, as a representative in some way, and it's like I need to really be, you know, I think about, I, all the time, I spend a lot of time thinking about the stuff that I do and say, because I think it's important, and I don't want to, you know, fuck up, basically. Mm. And so I was worried, you know, I had a lot of kind of worries about, you know, making the wrong steps or saying the wrong things, and then I realised, you know, that's just... If you really think like that, you never really do anything mm. or say anything. And I thought if it could help, you know, I really care about these issues and this, you know, the documentary that w we wanted to make, I felt like was important. And I was like, oh, I'm being ridiculous. Like, this would be a really great thing to be part of. Yeah. So, yeah. Lilia, did you just want to talk a, um, a bit about how the project came, around, came about and why Antidote um, um, contacted Ollie? Yeah, well, we sort of seen in the press and watched a few things online that Ollie had done <clears throat> about mental health um, and we thought it was really powerful stuff 
and we knew about years and years. We loved the music. Not that was the reason we approached him. Um, and we just thought that, you know, we have done a lot of films in the mental health space, and Ollie just seemed really sort of passionate about the area. So we kind of approached to get a meeting in with him and Martha, his manager. I think what sort of struck us immediately about Ollie, which was probably why we actually really sort of pursued this film, is that he was so genuine and it's coming from the right place. You know, it's not, he doesn't need to chase fame, doesn't need to chase money. You know, Ollie really did want to make this film to make a difference. And I think working with somebody with that intention is just, you know, a real privilege for us. And that's the space that we come from too. And I think, you know, it's very easy with TV to sort of try and get the ratings or try and make something that, you know, just gets the headlines, you know, and that's really not what we're about as a company, and we're sort of working in really sort of sensitive situations in very vulnerable places with vulnerable people. And I think we really sort of take that as a huge privilege. And as soon as we sort of had that first meeting with Ollie, we just immediately knew that he was the right person for us to be working with to make this film. There hasn't been a film done on this, you know, in terms of mental health in the LGBT community. So it's kind of, which is a big shock when you sort of hear about <coughs> statistics that, you know, that put together with Ollie's intention for us was just, yeah, a no-brainer. We just pursued it really, really quickly after that. Antidotes had a, um, you know, the history of the Professor Green films and, and this film is, you know, you're working with talent and talking about very, very sensitive um, subject matter. What, what do you, when you're, how do you approach films when you've kind of got all that um, stuff to kind of consider? I mean, the big thing for us is trust. I mean, that is sort of the number one on our list. And it's kind of, you know, we need, to have the trust of the contributors and of the person who's going to be fronting the film because, as I said, it's a real privilege to go into these people's lives and hear their stories, mm. you know, and without that trust, Ollie's not going to want to open up. The people aren't going to want to tell their stories, you know, so for us, that's the number one thing. And I think for us, you know, the priority is always going to be the people in the film and then the film second. That is just how we operate. So I think we work very, very closely with BBC because obviously a lot of these people who sort of appear, the contributors can be sort of on the brink, and we have to do everything we can to protect them. We would never want to do anything with A, damage them, B, damage Ollie, C, you know, damage anything. It has to be sort of really positive mm. outcome. It's never going to be easy making these films because they are difficult situations and they're sort of, you know, emotional journeys. But by the same token, it's got to have a positive impact, and that's really, really important to us. So we work very closely with charities to make mm. sure the tone of the film is right. You know, Ollie is trusting us to sort of, you know, he is, it's his voice essentially. You know, so we have to take that really, really seriously and make sure that, A, sort of the communication from the beginning, we're all on the same page, this is the film we're going to make and how we're going to make it, and B, sort of the process, if anything mm. goes wrong, if you're not happy, um, and just to make sure that, yeah, we're sort of all coming from the same place and trying to yeah. achieve the same things. Yeah. Vicky, just to bring you in, you were, you know, you've produced and directed this, and, you know, in, 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 how did you approach it? What was the process that you... Um, how did you approach the filmmaking? Um... Yeah, we're still actually making it. Mm. We've got, <laughs> we're shooting next week and we're still editing it. Um, for me, it's uh, personal to me as well. I grew up gay and, and so I kind of brought uh, my own stuff to it, you know, my own empathy. And it's one of the reasons Ollie and I just clicked straight away was because we have a, a sort of shared history. And that was, you know, and we also... Um, uh, the assistant producer who's here today, Pete Grant, is also... Um, gay, and it, it was quite important for us to kind of, be, you know, to be able to empathise with all our contributors mm -hmm. and the rest of it. But yeah, it's um, the, 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 you know, Ollie and I sat down for hours before we actually shot a frame of this and talked about what it was that we wanted to achieve. What's what, you know, I, I learned a lot about Ollie. We talked about the kind of contributors that we would cast. So it was very much a collaboration, um, and I think that's really important because, you know. Ollie is incredibly creative and it's, he's putting his heart, you know, out there and, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, should, we, should we watch um, just so people can um, get a sense of um, what, what, what's happening in the film? Should we just watch a clip? I think that we've got the diary clip is first mm. up. How do, how do you feel watching that? Horrible. <laughs> <Do> you? <laughs> Vicky, do you want to um. talk about that scene? <clears throat> Um, yeah, it was, as I said, Ollie and I talked for hours before we started, you know, filming anything. It was like quite a long development process. And, um, yeah, I can't remember how it came up, but we, we, we started talking about diaries and I was like, oh God, that feels quite sort of intrusive to ask. But eventually we... Show me the diaries. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 
and um, we got them back from your mums, didn't we? And yeah, and, uh, yeah, it was quite a difficult scene to film, wasn't it? Really. Well, it was it was hard. Yeah, I mean, I've kept diaries ever since I was about eleven years old, um, like on and off. And so, um, yeah, Vicky asked me to look, th you know, have a look through some stuff if anything might be, you know, relevant to this. And I put it off until about like two days before the shoot day, and because uh, I just didn't want to have to like go through everything. And um, it was quite an intense experience, but it was really, it was very, I don't know, I guess it was quite, it was definitely interesting and. You know, actually, to be honest, making this whole documentary and, it's, you know, I've been done a lot of, like, reflecting on, you know, growing up and stuff, and you realise how, how, how funny memory is and the things that you think you remember and you're certain about often just aren't true or, like, the things that you don't remember happening uh, but did happen. And I don't know, it's just... I don't know, it's, I'm not really making a very coherent point, but just, like, how the quality of memory is very like fluid and um, I'm still figuring all that stuff out. <laughs> um, it's yeah. just, you talk about it in, in that clip there and it's just, you talk about in, uh, the sense in the film that LGBT people have a much higher likelihood of having mental health issues. What, what do you think's behind that? What, what, what needs to change well, for that I, to get better? That's why we made this documentary, you know. I think really there's, there's so many areas in which we can say, oh, well, you know, growing up being othered by the society that you grow up in is going to lead to all these different, you know, reactions and, and, and give you all these feelings. And I think the, the problem comes from so many different areas, you know, so it's like a, a child hearing negative language at school, not having support from teachers, suffering family rejection, you know, their mm. first romantic experiences are shrouded in shame and secrecy and then you know, that develops into adulthood and then it's hard to form intimate relationships and it's hard to, you know, it, it just kind of branches out and it just gets mm. very, like, knotty. And it's, mm. I think, when, once you pull at one thread, you realise, oh, OK, well, we need to kind of help... And edu we, need to, we need to go into schools and make sure we have LGBT-inclusive sex and relationship education. But then you pull another thread and you go, well, we need to be talking to families and getting sure that they can support their queer children. And mm. then you need to go into, like, government and make sure policy is protecting... You know what I mean? So it's just, like, mm. this very... Mm multi-layered yeah. issue. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what we've learned from, from doing this is there isn't one LGBT person that we've spoken to has, who has escaped unscathed from their upbringing mm. and, and kind of the, the sort of stigma and, mm. and discrimination that, you know, we all experience. I mean, you know, even the healthiest of us, I think it's, it's just something that really affects you. You know, mm. it's that con you know, whether it's kind of being worried to, you know, can you hold your hand with your partner in public... Mm. It's constantly negotiating those kinds of things, yeah. or can you be out at work, or you know, all of those things. Mm. You, you, you mentioned when we were just chatting earlier that you were filming yesterday in a school in um, North London where Ollie went up with um, Paris Lees. What kind of reception do you get in schools? Do you think <coughs> people are open that they want to hear? What's, are, is it easy to kind of get into schools and have those conversations? I don't think, and we, we went into that school with an organisation called Diversity Role Models, and I think Stonewall do it as well, and All About Trans do it. We went in with, with Paris Lees, who's a friend of Ollie's. And, um, yeah, I, don't, I think it's quite hard to get into schools, and that's why Diversity Role Models, you know, do that. And the school we went to already worked with this organisation, but it's, it's a school that is, has a constant battle because they do all the good work at school, and then the kids go home, and it's undone. So it was quite an interesting yeah. experience, wasn't it? And the impression I get really uh, talking to young people as well, you know, like young, I think, it, and schools specifically, vary massively in <coughs> terms of, you know, what kind of st structures they have in place to support their LGBT students or what, what they're advising their teachers if there's homophobic bullying. And, you know, like some schools are doing really well and some schools mm. have, there's nothing. Mm. So I think that disparity is something, yeah, we need needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I watched the, um, the, the film, and it's, it's, it's still um, a rough cut, um, last night, and it's incredibly powerful and so many powerful scenes. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about one scene that particularly um, struck me, is when you spoke about when you were in school and you described the people around you in school as your enemies, which is heartbreaking, I think, to hear that. How did you end up in such a dark place? What was happening? Doesn't everyone have enemies at school? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, well, you know, this, I suppose it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy to really kind of sum it up, but um, I, w I had a really, I was having a really tough time at home, and um, I didn't feel really, like, particularly comfortable at home, 
um, or at times safe. And so I didn't really feel safe at school either because I was getting picked up and bullied because I was too girly or too effeminate. Um, and I really went out of my way sometimes to, to, to kind of be different. You know, I'd wear makeup or I'd wear, you know, jewelry that would stand out. And I was a real target. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I kept it all, uh, you know, I didn't tell anybody that I was having a, I was struggling or having a tough time. So then I, I kind of just started to blame myself for everything. And mm. I just started to think that, you know, I didn't have anyone who understood me or that I was just a freak, that something wrong with me. Um, so I, I, I suppose I just then, you know, I did have some enemies for sure, like who didn't want me to have a good time. But I think I also just cast everybody as enemies as well, mm. because I thought if they knew who I really was, they'd, they'd be disgusted, you know. And what age did you first open up and talk to? Because there's an amazing scene in the film as well where you talk to an old school friend and yeah. she didn't know what was going on. Um, when was the first time you shared with people exactly what you were going through? I mean, I'm still working. I mean, <laughs> like, I still struggle to share with people, you know, what I'm really feeling, but which is probably funny because, you know, I do it in, like, newspapers and, you know, in TV shows now, but... Um, I suppose it took me like until I was 19, 20 when I started seeing uh, like actual healthcare professionals um, that I understood that being open about my experiences would be a pathway to like he healing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it took me into my early 20s really to start doing that and I'm still kind of filling in gaps for, uh, for things, you know. Mm -hmm. Just, there's, there's an amazing um, uh, uh, contributors in the film, and I just want to talk to you, Lily and Vicky uh, about the casting process. These are people we talked, you know, touched on before that they're people sometimes in crisis. There's a lot of sensitivities. We've got to have an incredible duty of care towards them. How do you go about trying to engage these contributors in the first place, and how do you convince them to tell their stories on camera? Um, we worked very closely with um, uh, organisations like Stonewall and Mind, uh, Terence Higgins Trust, um, and that was the start of the process. And they all actually are quite a, our contributors came through social media, interestingly, but th sort of through the through the charities, and they advised us on how to work with those vulnerable people. So we had a really serious safeguarding protocol in place. And it was, it was quite a long process. We met them several times before we actually filmed to make sure that they were happy with what we were doing. And, you know, we're very, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we wanted to know what story they wanted to tell and make sure it was the right thing for them to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was quite a long process before we actually started filming. And then, you know, it's an ongoing relationship, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shall, shall we show? I'm probably going to change the order of the clips now because I think it's probably a good time maybe to show yeah. the Connor clip because just on the, off the back of what you were talking about, what you went through in school, and I think just about the contributor, he's an amazing contributor, um, Connor. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a scene in the film, Ollie, where um, you talk about the fact that you're finding the documentary harder to make than you thought it would be. What, what, what was happening there? Why was that? Um, probably a couple of things. Um, you know, f firstly, I suppose, uh, you know, I have to make a real effort to look after my mental health, you know, like, I do that every day, you know, like, that. I'm not, this, you know, it's not like I'm on one side and the people that we talk to, like Connor, are on the other, like, I'm, I'm really, in some ways, like, I'm, you know, I, I could be on the other side as well, you know, mm. like, so I suppose I didn't quite realise how much making the, the documentary would bring up some issues for me and things that I might not have really fully dealt with. But, you know, that's something that, that, that I'm dealing with, you know, I'll, for the rest of my life. But um, also, the, the contributors that we spoke to, um, actually, especially one young guy called Sean, um, I mean, you just get so invested in, the, in these people's lives, you know, and it's like... You just, I don't know, it's just, they're opening up to you and, and, and some, you know, some, I think some of them are in crisis, you know. Sean is, would, was, you know, kind of in recovery from, we'd been through rehab and was kind of in recovery for, you know, like drugs and sex addiction and, you know, slamming and just, like, he, he, and it was so recent for him and he was just being... So he was such an amazing, like, positive, like, wonderful person to be around. He was so amazing, but just, you know, opening up to you and, like, I don't know, just, it really, like, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's a lot, it's very overwhelming, and you just want to help, and you're like, am I, 
you, you, you hope that you're doing as much as you can, and, but it's, mm. you know, it's difficult, it's just, mm. yeah. And then you think about you know, our community, our LGBT community and the problems that we face, and it is just sometimes, it is just very sad, and it's, it's it, yeah, it makes me feel sad. <laughs> and and, and, and w were there any particular shoots we contributors that you found more difficult? Um, definitely, the, actually, the, the probably shooting with Sean, um, yeah. just because I could tell how hard it was for Sean to, to do it and how much of a difference it was making to him, I think, yeah. to be able to talk about what was happening to him. I don't know if you yeah. think that as well. Yeah. Um, and he's such a, just a wonderful person. I, don't, I mean, they were all really, really amazing people. I think with Sean, it also felt quite close to home because we were mm -hmm. similar age and, you know, we're we both live in London, and I just, I know so many people like Sean who struggle with drugs and struggle, you know, with drugs and sex and struggle just being an out gay person, um, that it was very, yeah, it was difficult. Mm. Yeah, just, um, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that it, 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 both the Professor Green film and this film, I think one of the themes that run through it, and is kind of, you hear it very, very kind of loud and clear, is about that people shouldn't be keeping secrets and people need to communicate and people need to talk. And, you know, there was just the, the, the mental health um, campaign that the Royals were involved in a while ago and it was about speaking out. Do you think, how do we, how do we make sure that we, we provide a safe space for people to speak out? What has to change? What can we do? Well, I think Films like this, you know, our hope for this film is that it is going to have an impact. You know, I think a lot of people in the general public won't be aware of some of the problems that are facing the LGBT community think everything's fine. You know, so it's kind of raising awareness of some of the struggles that are being faced. I think it's really, really important getting some of the stats out there, telling some of these stories that are really heartbreaking. And, you know, everyone's human. And I, it is going to have an impact on, you know, hearing the struggles that some of these people face. You can't just sort of walk away from that and switch off your brain because the camera stopped rolling. You know, it's a really, really tough thing for Ollie to go through, and it's going to be a really tough thing for the contributors to go through. But the hope is that at the end of it, there's going to be this film that a lot of people are going to come to and watch, and it's going to make a difference in terms of, yeah, people talking about things and sort of raising awareness mm. of the issue. I think the first step is sort of getting some of the issues out there mm. to start yeah. the dialogue. And then after that, it's sort of how do we deal with things? I think it's, it's definitely that. People, we don't talk about it. So you're growing up, you don't talk about it. Mm. And, and, you know, when you come into the gay community, if you're having a problem, it's kind of like we're complicit in actually covering up that there is a problem mm. because you kind of want to go, oh, we've got gay marriage. We're like, we're really happy, we're really proud. Mm. And, and actually, um, you know, we don't talk about it ourselves because we want to project this kind of, you know, happiness and there are problems. And I think the more you talk about it, the better it gets, and, you know, at school. And, and also, like, don't assume, you know, I think, you know, our you know, friends and family don't ever assume everything is, is OK mm. because often it isn't. I think it's multi-layered as well, like you were saying. It's not just there's going to be one solution to all, all of this. I think, you know, it is raising awareness. It's looking at stuff that can be done in schools. It's looking at, like you said, like at a policy level. But I think films like this, you know, they can be sort of turning points in terms mm. of, you know, how society view things and what issues are talked about. And that's what we really hope to achieve by making this. But it's just, I think it's, it's just sad that there still is such a stigma about, you know, so people are very, very open about talking about their physical health and their mental health. I've heard you say before, Ollie, that, you know, if um, you call someone to say, I can't go to a party tonight because I'm sick, um, I've been throwing up or whatever else, easy, I can't go to a party tonight because I'm depressed. People just don't, don't understand it or don't engage it. I just want to um, talk one, and people in the room will probably remember um, uh, uh, the moment when you, at Glastonbury, um, when you gave the speech on the stage and you spoke out about LGBT people living with fear. Can you explain what motivated you to say that at that time and, 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 um, and um, um, well, how people responded? Yeah, I, I mean, that actually, I mean, that Glastonbury um, was just, a, I think, a few weeks or a month after the shooting at Pulse in Orlando. And um, I suppose, it, yeah, and it just was real... It did really affect me um, when that happened, and you know, and a lot of my friends. And I just thought, I'm about to play the biggest stage of my life um, in front of you know so many people, and it's being filmed for the telly. Like, 
this is a real opportunity for me to like actually put into action the things that I believe in. You know, I get to have a platform and I could say something here. You know, maybe it will make a difference. So I thought, okay, I'm going to say something. And it was also the start of Pride Month. Um, it was Pride Weekend in London, I think, that weekend. So I just thought, um, yeah, so I'd say something. And I guess, you know, when, when things like, you know, I mean, sadly, we're all, this is our reality now, but we all kind of live in a world where we're, you know, we're afraid of un unknown things happening and the world can seem really scary. And f for queer people, you know, I think you, depending on, you know, I think you do live with fear every, as part of your everyday because you're afraid of, you know, what someone might think of or say to you in the street. If you're, you know, holding your partner's hand or kissing your partner, you, you fear abuse or, you know, you fear violence, like you fear being, you know, sacked at work or you fear you won't get the job or fear that people, you know, that is just a part of what you have to do. And I think that's part of why pride is very, it's all about overcoming that in a way and showing your solidarity and being proud. But I think, which is great, but then I think at the same time there has to be a, recognition that actually we might be saying we're proud and feeling proud and but actually you know the reality is we're also scared sometimes a sense of enforced pride yeah but, i mean yeah. i yeah i don't know what do you think yeah no i think <laughs> yeah i think i think you, you you don't want to talk about it because you don't want to present a problem it's kind of yeah. you know but actually the best thing you can do is is kind of shine mm. a light on it and have a discussion yeah mm. You know, I, I, I've, I've, I find this interesting because I've heard you talk in the past and you mentioned in, 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 um, about that if you had the opportunity to press a button that would get rid of any mental health distress that you've had or would have, um, th that you wouldn't press it. Yeah. W why is that? Well, I guess it's part of the, how I kind of... Um, you know, cope every day <laughs> is um, by viewing my own, you know, mental health as a positive part of me, mm. you know, so a, a lot of the work that I've done on that is really about kind of not rejecting the fact that sometimes I get really depressed and don't want to get about, about out of bed, not rejecting that I get really anxious or, mm. you know, not feeling ashamed that I had an eating disorder or not instead kind of getting close to those things and trying to see them in a more positive way and being able to kind of have a better relationship with... I'm not saying that will work for everybody, by the way, but it just kind of... I think it works for me. And mm. if I pressed a button and got rid of all those things, I don't really know what I'd be left with. Right. <laughs> so, and I don't want to be left with nothing, so... No. Yeah. Of course. Um, it, 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 there's, a, there's an amazing scene in the film where you organise a mental health um, night and you introduce an honesty box yes. at the night. What, what, what inspired you to do that, and what did you hope to learn from the honesty box? Well, I thought it'd be a fun thing to do, because um, we put on this mental health night uh, at the Glory, which is a venue in, in London, a gay venue in London, and um, it was all about kind of celebrating mental health, and I just thought it would be really interesting to kind of bring something that's not really usually in that kind of environment, which is usually, you know, drinking, partying, and make it a space that you could talk about mental health and um, if you wanted to. And so this honesty box was the idea that people could, you know, have coloured pens and stickers and paper and just write something down and put it in a box anonymously. Um, and it was sort of like somewhere between like an art project and a confession and I don't know what it was. But then, yeah, some of the stuff that we got was just really like very overwhelming. And because I think we're, we're just what I'm realizing more and more and more is how we're all really going through the same things. We're all thinking the same things, but we're just really, it's so hard to say it. And some of the mm. stuff that people were writing, you know, it was really, really affecting. Mm. Um, I, if you, I can't think of any one specific now that I'm trying to, that I could say. Were, yeah, there were all sorts. Yeah, it was um, just, you know. Did you find them surprising? I think if you give someone the opportunity to be really honest, people want to be honest. Mm. You know, they, yeah. they, they want to say something. So yeah. I guess that wasn't a surprise, but some of it I was surprised how, I guess, if you scratch, it's just like you scratch the surface of something. There's yeah. like this entire just, so goes so deep. There's so much yeah. going on underneath. Yeah. And that's, okay. yeah.
I think that night is a perfect example. Like everyone's having a great time and laughing, and, and then yeah. they're writing yeah. these kind of messages of actually, you know, uh, you know. So I'm on the surface, about. everything looks yeah, 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 fine exactly. and rosy, and yeah. And I do want to say that the film is really fun and celebratory, <laughs> oh, it is. as well as talking it is. because Ollie's very up and light yeah. and bright and fun, and, and yeah. so it isn't all doom and, a great and gloom. Dancer. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> Damien. <laughs> um, shall we look at another clip? This is the clip. Do you want to, do you want to introduce this clip, Vicky? Um, yes, so we um, went home uh, with Ollie to see his mum, and, uh, and so we went to his teenage bedroom. <laughs> so let's see Ollie's teenage bedroom. Action happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to open it up to the audience in a bit, and just one final question, just to get a sense from all of you guys. We touched on a little bit of this as we go on, but if... It, 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 what would, what, I'm going to ask each of you actually this question. What do you hope the legacy of this film is? What would you hope for? What would you like to see change? What, would you like to, what difference would you like to see? Start with you, Ollie. Um, <laughs> well, I think uh, mental health for queer people is hugely important. Um, I think, you know, as a country, mental health is really emerging as an important topic for everybody, as it, sh as it should be. Um, I just hope there is some attention given... And actually, specifically, I think we've just gotten, you know, sex and relationship education mandatory in schools across the country, but there needs to be LGBT inclusive sex and relationship education. And whether that's a whole other documentary by itself, but like... Is that, that's not going to happen within well, the plans I don't the think so. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah. Currently. <laughs> so, no. uh, yeah, I think that would be a really, really great first, well, step somewhere. Um, and I just hope... If someone watches it and goes, oh, you know, I'm not alone, then that would be great, too. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the LGBT inclusive, inclusive sex education, sex and relationship education would be incredible, but, you know, I, I think that we're a long way off from yeah. that at the moment. Yeah. Um, uh, but it would be great if it was, you know, that this film would get people talking about it. Um, and I think the other thing is just that, that people watch it and realise and kind of look after each other a bit more and talk mm. and talk a bit more because mm. a, lot of, a lot of people are just covering up problems, yeah. as, you know, with all mental health kind of stories. Mm. So that yeah. would be great. Yeah, I mean, it's been an education for us of developing and making this film. We've learned so much. So I think we can get that out, you know, into the public domain, change some people's perceptions and just, like you say, young people not to feel they're alone. You know, they can go to somebody, they can speak, you know, they're not freaks, they're not, you know, everyone is different in their own way. It's kind of, I think that's what we really sort of want to get out there with this film. I think Ollie says at one point, um, you know, uh, if I'd watched something like this when I was younger, yeah. it would have yeah. made such a big difference. Mm. And, that, and that's, you know, and that's right. I think mm. hopefully young people watching it, parents watching it will kind of learn alone. something and, and maybe it will help them to yeah. communicate more. Yeah. yeah. Shall we open up for questions now? Has everyone got questions ready? Your question. Oh. First of all, Ollie. Oh. Hi. First of all, Ollie, thank you so much for all you've done for LGBT rights, just in general, because you're a hero of mine, so there you go. <laughs> but my question is um, I grew up, well, in a Catholic school, and uh, I found coming out quite hard because of that as aspect as well. And I wondered, because we touched upon some of the reasons why people do struggle, and I wondered how much you thought that maybe religion was stopping the progression of LGBT people as well. Well, I mean, faith and religion is a huge part of, you know, the LGBT community and, and, and also people's stories and why they might be struggling to come out or struggling with their mental health. It's very connected. I think one of the things that we spoke about a lot when we were figuring out how, what we were going to spend some time really trying to uncover during the documentary, because there's so many, you know, it's so connected, there's so many like intersects really, whether it's religion, faith, um, race, gender, social class that, that impact each other and connect, you know, so you're right, religion is a huge aspect of, 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 of all of this. And I think it deserves, you know, like 10 documentaries mm -hmm. just on that, you know, so it's, it's quite, yeah. <laughs> get, we just did one. Get commissioning. <laughs> and actually, one of our contributors, Sean, that's part of his story as well. His, his um, parents were very religious and caused lots of problems for him with, with his family. I think family rejection really is, is such a huge 
I'm not, say I'm not saying that's part of your story, but I think it's connected, you know, often we see families of faith um, where maybe they're different generations, first, second generations, or where the kids are completely rejected by their parents because, you know, it doesn't align with their values or their faith, and that's, it's really tricky because you have to respect people's faith, and, tr you know, there's a lot of, this, in some cases, like with Sean, for instance, you know, his mum loves him so much, and they really care and love for each other, and they've now happily found a way, I think, to communicate and, and, and love each other as they want to, but it's really hard for them. So, yeah. But it is interesting, because yeah, it is when Sean talks in the film about that his mother, she didn't... The fact that he was gay wasn't an issue for her. It was the fact that she thought she'd be in heaven and he, he'd be in hell, yeah. and that they wouldn't meet again, and that was the thing that kind of, you know, um, drove them apart. Thanks for your question. <laughs> Got one up here and one here as well. Hi, yeah. Um, I was just wondering how you think that uh, educating parents. How how would you like to educate parents? What would be the process about go, about doing that? Because my parents supported me coming out, but they knew nothing at all. Because um, I don't. There's like I was the first person in my family to come out as gay. Well, I think it's a. Yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping someone has a good answer for this. Because <laughs> it's a really big challenge, you know. How do you educate people who weren't... I'm not saying your parents are uneducated, but weren't ed educated about the things that you want them to be educated about, right? So it's, it's really tricky. But, and I think, you know, part of this is... Part of, not to bring it back to... Always bring it back to what we're doing today, but, like, part of the reason why I wanted to do this was I thought maybe someone's... A family might watch it. And, some, you know whether the kids are straight or whoever's straight or queer, that might have a really positive impact, you know, if we do have these messages in our culture and our media that I think that does have, you know, a knock-on effect into people's understanding of, 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 of queer, of, of what it is, to, what it means being queer. Um, but I think also it's like, I don't know, what else? What else can we do? <laughs> I'm just, just thinking that, like, Parents and mums is a really strong theme in our documentary yeah. because um, Ollie had a very frank discussion with his lovely mum, Vicky, for the documentary where they kind of hadn't really talked about a lot, of, a lot of the stuff. So, you know, Vicky had read a lot of stuff in the media that, you know, you hadn't actually talked, talked about. And um, I think, uh, yeah, just, just talking, like, I think that's... Really, really helpful. It's difficult now to talk to my mum about being gay. Tell me about we've it. never really had those discussions. Well, it was, it, yeah, it's so hard to do. I mean, I st I'm, I'm really close to my mum, and I still, there were so many things that I hadn't talked to her about. And I did for this, and one of the things that she said to me, which, you know, I asked her, did you always think I was gay, expecting her to just say, yeah. Which, and she kind of said, I did suspect it, but I was so worried that you would have a tougher life. I didn't want to... I just blocked it from my mind. So to me, you were no sexuality. You just... You were who you were. And it, I hadn't... I just had never seen that... And that would make sense to me, but I'd never seen it from that point of view before. before. And it really, made, it really made sense to me why she might have responded in the ways that she did when I was growing up. And just having that conversation was, like... It was, it was really... It was... It was really worth it, but it's not easy. God, it's... Yeah. Yeah, there's just no resources really at any level, you know, no. whether it's the parents' generation or the kids' generation. There just doesn't really seem to be any kind of support out there, you know, mm. which is not right. Mm. Thank you. I think we've Thank got you. quite a few. There's, <laughs> what, there's a lady over here, and there's one over here. Um, I saw at uh, Mighty Hoopla last week where you mentioned this documentary. Yes. Um, I was wondering how much um, this documentary and these discussions will feed into your music and how much your music might feed into future documentaries. Yeah, that's a good question <laughs> because I'm, I, I didn't, you know, the, the, the more I kind of, um, yeah, I, the past couple of years of my life have been quite uh, strange to for me, um, and I'm just learning stuff all the time and discovering stuff that, you know, me, that I find, um, you know, like speaking out on these issues and, and is, is really important to me, and I didn't necessarily know that until quite recently, uh, you know, like a year or two ago. Um, and the music, I've been making music in the past couple of years too, and then somewhere along the line I realized that, you know, you can't, I mean, it would be weird if I kind of just like completely separated 
my musical identity from, from my other identities or something, so it does feel like they are in some way, n maybe people would never be able to tell, but for me at least, they're, they're, they are like very like enmeshed with each other. Um, I don't know really how it's gonna <laughs> influence it, but I, I try and just have like as militantly queer positive message all the time. <laughs> Everyone gets annoyed with me <laughs> because I'm like, it's not queer enough, or you know, <laughs> we're not being gay enough, or you know, and everyone's like, just chill out, but you know, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not about to. So yeah. I think I speak for everybody here when I say thank goodness you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lady, over here. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, sorry, it's a bit hard. Um, I've suffered from depression from being 15. Um, sorry, I'm now 32. Sorry. Um, and I find it hard enough sometimes. Um, I tend to put a smile on it, and people think that I'm, you know, really happy in life and sort of the party. Um, how do you cope with that in the public eye? You know, when you just sometimes you feel like you're falling apart, but you have to put this image out there because people don't always want to hear it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> it's just emotional talking about it and with my mum. And yeah, it is. No, don't apologise. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> um, we, we all do it, I think. We all just put on a brave face and... A lot of, you know, and, you know, I, I go out on stage and perform all the time and I'm, you know, that's my kind of way of coping in a way. Like, I'm very, like, put on a shiny pair of hot pants and, like, <laughs> I'm good to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my advice is, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I guess, you know, I have... A, I'll be honest, I've had a lot of therapy and, um, you know, and I still take medication and, you know, I've, um, you know, I've got to a good place now where I can deal with, you know, being in the public eye. Um, it is weird, but I feel like it's no, it's just, I guess, like, like I said at the beginning, it's something we all, ex we, we, we all experience, you know, and it's, it's constant struggle, it's constant maintenance in a way. Um, you have good days and bad days, and what I think is really brilliant, though, is, is and I know your mum's here as well, and oh my god, don't, I'm going to cry. Um, <laughs> aww. <laughs> like, it's good that, you know, we're even talking about this right now, like we're even having this conversation, I feel like. And we do, I mean, I've always talked to my mum about everything, so... Yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't here, so... Oh. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Um, so, I came out in secondary school in about year nine-ish, and then in year ten, um, everyone right through from year seven to year eleven managed to find out, um, which then led... Um, to me one day on the corridors, being beaten up. Um, <laughs> um, and like, I was like, just like bleeding and then like, I got like taken like, away and stuff like that, treated and the people that did it didn't actually get a proper punishment. They just got like told not to do it again. Um, and then when I left secondary school and went into college, I thought people would be a little bit more grown up, but the immaturity then carried on. And when I was on my course, um, I had a boyfriend and people like bullied me about that still. And like they'd like, take the mick out of him and take the mick out of me and like ask questions on how it worked because like he was trans and I was cis, and they were like, so how does that work? And they were like proper like probing, and like in public places as well, quite loud. Um, and then I got, so I left that course and then got threatened even more to be beaten up again. And like, what do you think we could do in schools and colleges that could like 
teach people not to be twats. And <laughs> <laughs> You know, people don't realise that this is what is reality for queer people, you know. They don't actually realise that this is what we go through, you know. I'm really sorry that you had that experience. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's so heartbreaking to hear. I think, you know, partly what we have to do is, you know, let it be known that this is what's happening. In schools, I think the problem is, like, it's tough because you have to... It has to come from the students, and it has to come from the teachers, and it has to come from, you know, who's giving money to the school. It has to come from all these different areas, and it's, people don't want to admit that there are problems in their schools. It's really, you know, it takes a real brave school to do that, and a brave student to speak out about it, you know, and so, well done for speaking. <laughs> um, I think we just have to keep reminding people that this is, this is going on, and, like, it's not okay. I think you know, what Ollie and Paris did on Friday with diversity role models in this school was, you know, incredibly powerful, you know, talking about it in schools and, and, and everyone being allies. So, you know, not letting that happen and, you know, and stepping in. I think that's... And teaching kids that's what they should, they should be doing instead of calling each other gay boy or, you know... I think, you know, those yeah. things are really important. And if that was compulsory, even better. When I got into year 11, I asked if we could get, like, stonewalling. Um, and like I'd got, I'd, I'd asked them for loads of uh, like posters and stuff like that, and I put them up around school, um, and they just like got graffitied on with like homophobic like slurs like faggot and gay boy. And was um, it just left? It and if we just left, like I'd told like the principal, and he did nothing about it. I told the vice principal, my mentor, and they did nothing about it. And like it just got to the point where I just gave up because there were no hope. Yeah. With them. Like. Yeah, it's completely outrageous. Like, it just cannot continue that way, you know. But sadly, it's still, you know, it's still happening, you know. Like, we can't just pretend like it's fine at schools, you know. We have, like, you know, we can't, like... it. But, you, like Vicky was saying, you know, we, there's this company Diversity Role Models, and, we go, and they go into schools, and they give workshops with students, and they say, you know, like... And just in, in, engaging with students at that level, I think, does have an impact. It does, it does work, I think, in some ways. It's that still hard for the queer kids but I think at least having someone who who is queer talking to them and their straight classmates saying you know if you do this like it's going to have a you know just letting them know the actual implications of, of the kind of behavior and, and language that they're using which you know I think it, that does seem to be at least one step in the right direction mm. but yeah we need a lot there's a lot of work to do thank you for sharing that as well <laughs> Can I be heard? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for that. As, yeah, that was an inspiring like, um, story. Um, what I was going to ask was, um, for you when you were younger, um, do you think it would have made a bigger effect if someone sort of came along and said, or that it was more visible that you could have like, kind of like a future in family and things like that? Because I think that kind of side of things with for, uh, queer people isn't really sort of um, put out there, that we actually can have a future with, you know, sort of like a family and things like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think it would have. And do you mean family, like... I mean, sort of, like, um, in, the, in the sense of, like, having a child and things like that, because a lot of people yeah. are, um, I don't know, for me, um, family's kind of, like, a big deal, so um, a lot of people who come from ethnic backgrounds, the whole, the whole culture is based around family, and yeah. a lot of the time you kind of feel as though, well, I can't marry a woman, so what, what's next for me? Do you know what I mean? So, like, in that kind of... Yeah, I think it... It, it's, I mean, still now, you know, if we ever, see, you know, on TV, in, in, uh, in adverts, you know, in government, you know, we, we're, we just mainly see, you know, heterosexual couples, you know, with, and like, it just, if you're a queer kid, it's like, you have no, you're like, oh, what's going to happen to me when I get older? Is anyone going to love me? Am I going to be able to have kids? Am I going to have to do things? I completely agree with you. It's like, it's, it's terrifying. I think we could, you know, there is work that I think there is some, like, progress and representation in terms of, like, in our media and stuff, but it's, like, we need to sort of be telling kids that, like, 
if you're gay or, or you know, if you're queer, you can still have this life and like, you can still be happy and you can still have relationships because no one tells you that. Like, no one. <laughs> but you can. <laughs> and you actually can. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Oli. Um, I wanted to ask you about your experience of the mental health service because I know Stonewall have done a lot of reports around homophobia in the NHS itself, so it's kind of like a double whammy, I guess, that dealing with coming out as gay but then having to potentially go into a, you know, an organisation that's institutionally homophobic in some ways, if you had any personal experience of that. Um, well, when I was 19, I... I started taking antidepressants, um, and you know I've seen loads of different loads of different doctors in the NHS because in London it feel, feels like you see doc, different doctor like every week, and I was really bad at making my appointments, so I'd just be like different GPs in different areas all the time, um, and I would, didn't tell anyone, you know, I never told anyone what my sexuality was, also because I was a bit kind of still in denial, um, but it was there was never any sort of like holistic approach as to why maybe you know sometimes I'd get referred to a counsellor, but there was sort of not not a great amount of, you know, why might you be feeling this way? It was sort of like, okay, well, you know, ticking boxes, which I understand, like, GP, a lot of GPs are under so much pressure, and it, it, it was the way, it, you know, it happened the way it is. But I have also found, um, you know, if you, if you get referred to a counsellor, you get a sick, usually you get, like, a six-week course of CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and therapists, mass, uh, therapists vary massively. And the chances of you getting a therapist that knows what it's like to be queer, understands gender identity, understands, you know, how that relates to the wider world, is, is very, very, very small, and actually it can have a damaging effect if you have someone that doesn't understand those issues. And, but we're not, you know, we don't, quite, we don't um, have the data of people's sexualities in the NHS, because it, that's right, isn't mm. it? You know, it's not, it's not available, so it's not really, it's just kind of being ignored, I think, really, and it's just potluck, which is uh, ridiculous. I mean... But I don't really know how. Yeah, and funding's being cut for LGBT um, services, yeah. so it's, it's, it's hard to find an LGBT counselling service, or, you know, it doesn't really... Yeah. Unless you're in London. Any more questions? <laughs> don't make me cry again. <laughs> <laughs> we got one at the back. Hi. Um... How do you think that filming this documentary has affected or changed your mental health from before you started to now you've finished and it's going to be put out into the public? Because I suppose film, uh, scenes like looking back over your diaries and things, that's dredged up probably a lot of things that you might have forgotten or blocked out of your memory, but then also maybe it's made you see how far you've come maybe since you were 14, 15. So I don't know, is it made it worse or better or a bit of both or yeah sure. I, I think you said it really well actually <laughs> it's a bit of both and I mean that's I think quite indicative of, of, of um, the relationship you have with mental health with, with your own mental health you know sometimes it's really positive sometimes it's negative um, and I definitely was a bit scared to do it because I just yeah, it's something, I definitely was a bit concerned that maybe I wasn't really in as good a place as I thought I was. Um, but you are right. Thank you for uh, yeah, what you said. Was, um, you know, looking back on all these things, I do think like I've actually come a very long way. <laughs> and um, it's really nice to, to actually remember that. Um, and, y y you know, so it's, yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think what you said is really interesting about memory being mm. fluid, because you know, ordinary people wouldn't have the opportunity or would never sort of go back through the whole life history and mem remember this, remember that. Must be such a weird, because obviously I've never done it, film people doing it, must be such a weird thing yeah. to sort of go through and, yeah, it's just interesting. What I found really weird was, um, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of my close friends and my mum and stuff for this documentary, you know, and I'd say, oh, do you remember when this happened? Or, you know, what was your opinion, what was your, what, what were your thoughts of what was going on at the time? And... Everybody had different stories. Everyone said different things. Everyone said, oh, you were like this. Or, but the majority of people were like, we just thought you were fine. You know, like we knew something was going on, but you know, you, you're so good at putting on a front that we all thought you were fine. And then I, was, then I had this moment where I was like, was I fine? Like, maybe I was just <laughs> yeah. fine. Like, maybe I'm just making all of this up. And like, 
then I had to read all my diaries and just, it was almost like I had to prove to myself that what actually happened to me happened. And then, then it was sort of like reliving everything again. And it's just, it's a strange thing how we live our lives kind of through other people's kind of yeah. accounts of us. And, and then you don't, don't know who to trust and it's like paranoia, but I mean, that's, I'm getting, going too far. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've wandered off on a tangent. Yeah, no, but I think, you know, the process of kind of, getting this film even started, and then you know, it's such a long process. By the time this comes out, it's probably been a year and a half, even two yeah. years since we first met. So a lot, you know, the audience at home will kind of see the finished product, but sort of knowing what goes into it and what actually it's really Ollie and the contributors have had to put everything into this film. So that's the only way the film can have an impact is if that happens, but it isn't an easy process, not just switch on the camera and do a bit of film and go home, and then that's mm. that, you know, it's, it takes a lot out of you and the contributors. And Vicky. And Vicky. <laughs> and us. And Pete. <laughs> and Layla. <laughs> Any more last chance for questions? The lady here. Um, in my own experience, I went to an all-girls school. So it was like a label. If you went to this school, you were a lesbian. So I felt a huge need to like distance myself as far away from that as I could. So I really pushed back my feelings and like my attraction towards girls. And it was really until only when I started liking you and like your band when I realized like it was completely normal um, that I came to terms with who I am and began to accept it. And my question is, <laughs> um, does that help your mental health at all knowing that you've you know, helped so many people accept who they are? Yes. And also, I, I, no, really it does. And also because I, when, you know, first started, when years and years, well, from the very beginning, I still was like, people aren't going to, like, I'm gay, like, they, they probably won't like me, you know, and I, I mean, I still sometimes think that, and, you know, when I go out in front of people, and, and having so many kind of, like, I've learned, like, it sounds real cheesy, but I have learned so much from the people that support us, because, you know, I see you guys, right, and, like, I, I know your stories as well, and, like, I see it on social media, and, like, it gives me so much like, hope and confidence that there are young people who are so understanding and so supportive of each other, and that then gives me so much like, confidence and you know, understanding for myself. So it's like, it really is like a two-way thing. Um, and it's been like, amazing to see that. You know, I went, like, what, you know, I went out in front of Wembley Arena once like, in drag, dressed as the zombie Jerry Halliwell, and I was like, <laughs> I was like terrified, but also it felt so good. I was like, I could never have done this unless years and years had received the kind of support that it had. And specifically, especially our early shows, very like queer spaces. And it was just like, it really does, yeah, make, mean so much to me. Because you helped like um, ages ago, I did, I did tell you this like a year ago. But you did an interview with Alan Carr and you spoke about, you know, sexual fluidity and, like, mm. how it's completely normal. And then that was the first time that my mum turned to me and she said, like, oh, I get it. And that was, like, amazing for me because, like, she didn't understand it yes. at all. Good. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that makes me happy. <laughs> Thanks. One, one final question from me for Ollie before we wrap up. Are there any other areas you think you'd like to explore for TV, for a film? <laughs> something fun <laughs> uh, I don't know yeah, yeah. never say never but never I, I can't never. yeah who knows okay brilliant listen thank you thank you everyone in the audience and thanks for all the questions and the contributions it was a massive thanks to the panel to uh, Vicky to Lilia but a huge huge thank you and a massive applause for Ollie for being so open and sharing this experience <laughs>